Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, happy Sabbath. Um, I'm at church. I guess you're at home. Uh, this is the new reality that we're living with. Believe it or not, the church still exists, and uh, we're trying to take good care of it. Um, and uh, this is a new reality that we're all kind of adjusting to. I hope you've been blessed and you have um, uh, experienced a blessing with what we've tried to do uh, regarding church and regarding um, our online use, our website, and just even some of the, uh, the phone calls that we're trying to make uh, that Pastor Jeff has organized to different church members. And so hopefully if you haven't gotten a call soon, we hope you will. We, we do want to check in on people and see how they're doing. Um, so please let us know if we haven't reached out to you yet. You can reach us uh, on our website that has all of our contact info, www.wichitaadventist.org. Um, you can message me privately with my email, uh, Pastor Ford, uh, Ford with an E at the end, remember, Pastor Ford 2013 at gmail.com. Um, we would love to kind of know how everyone's doing. Um, I was just sort of thinking today that uh, it's, it's kind of odd because I don't know when I'm going to see some of you again. And that makes me sad. Um, this uh, new reality has put us in some uncertain territory just regarding of even when we can meet again. And, and I, I don't know what to tell you on that. We're, we're trying to be responsible and, and listen to a variety of people who are experts in this because we don't want to put people at risk. We want to be good citizens and do our part. At the same time, we, we do want to meet and we want to worship together. We want to pray together and worship together. And so just as soon as we're able to do that, we will. My fear is that by the time that happens, I'll be gone. So, um, I hope that uh, if I don't get to say goodbye to you, this can serve in its stead and um, maybe we can see each other again when I get back. I don't know. Life is funny like that. And uh, so, not trying to say a final goodbye, but just kind of a window into my world and a window into Heather's world. Um, Easter is a time that we have tried to take seriously here at this church, and we've always tried to do something special during this weekend, and I'm a little bit sad that we can't meet in person, but I, I, I hope that the message that I give and um, just the truth of what this celebration of Easter is about will stay with you. And it will remind us that even though we face uncertain days, um, we have hope for the future. And so please remember that. And it doesn't matter what happens in this life, um, so long as we keep the faith, we have that hope. Hope in the coming of our Lord, hope in the reality that our stories don't end here, they can continue on. And that's because of the resurrection, because Jesus is raised, we can be raised too. And so we look forward to that together. So I hope you have a blessed weekend. and. Uh, I hope we'll get an opportunity uh, to uh, say goodbye or at least uh, say see you later. Well, blessings. I'm not sure that my church sees the need of the blind and other disabilities. When I was born, my optic nerve had stopped growing in the womb sometime. And it's just a thing that happened. 
made me extremely nearsighted. As I got older, my vision started to deteriorate. Um, in high school, I used to be like borderline legally blind, 2200. I dropped 2400, 2600. Then they took away my 20. Now I'm 10 over a thousand. When I was 11, somebody came with my um, Commission for the Blind caseworker and told my parents about this camp for the blind. It was kind of a new thing to this area. Would they like to try sending me? When I went to blind camp, I found hope. You know, I, I kept going to this camp for the blind to, to this day. Christian Record had these um, Bible studies books. One of my favorite, favorite books that Christian Record had given to me, aside from my first large print Bible, Steps to Christ. It's such a foundation book and it's just so easy to relate to, to read. And not only did, did Christian Record know to make the print bigger, but they knew to make the font different. It was one time at a camp, actually um, a Christian Record camp in Canada, Camp New Frienda. I'm laying there at Camp New Frienda on my stomach, drawing like I do, you know. And I used to make these calendars, hand-drawn calendars. I'd give them to my family for Christmas. The uh, Christian Record director that was there saw me drawing and said, wow, I, I, I think you should draw a calendar for Christian Record Services. And that's where that started. I think the Christian Record Services is the best kept secret of the Adventist Church. The Seventh-day Adventist Church, through them, is reaching a marginalized population that otherwise may never hear the gospel. That's where I met the Lord, and there are thousands more like me that need your help. Won't you please give to Christian Record Services so that these people can know that you hear them and you get it, and you could reach them. In the movie Forrest Gump, one of the most endearing and enduring lines comes when Tom Hanks is sitting on a bench and he's waiting for a bus and he's, he's chatting with a complete stranger. And to the complete stranger, he says, Mama always said, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. And I think that line is memorable for many people. Not just because um, Tom Hanks says it or not just because of the way he says it. I, I think we remember it because it's true. We can identify. Life is uncertain. You never know what you're going to get. You never know what lies around the corner. And this is the true reality that we are currently living in today with this pandemic with this virus and all that is happening because of it, both personally and economically with the governments, with the world. Life is uncertain. And I, th I think it's truly a sign of the times when a celebrity wrestler by the name of Hulk Hogan, who certainly is not known for his piety or his you know, religious practices, preaches a sermon on his Facebook account. And listen to what he says, and I, I just want to quote it. I found this in a, another news site which referenced his post. Hogan says, in three short months, just like he did with the plagues of Egypt, God has taken away everything that we worship. Hogan begins, God said, you want to worship athletes? I'll shut down the stadiums. You want to worship musicians? I will shut down civic centers. You want to worship actors? I'll shut down theaters. You want to worship money? I will shut down the economy and collapse the stock market. You don't want to go to church and worship me? I'll make it to where you can't go to church. 
And then Hogan, he imagined God calling for people to repent in prayer. And he quoted this famous scripture that says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Well, I'm sure different theologians from a variety of different faiths can argue about the role that God has played in this pandemic. But I I do think there's truth in what he's saying. You know, during this pandemic, we're reminded how unpredictable things are and we're reminded how fragile life is and we're reminded how untrustworthy our false gods truly are the gods that we worship, the sports, the music, the money, how in the end they let us down. We can't count on them. And maybe that's the larger point that he was making. We're not the captain of our ships. We can't even, we can't even chart the course for our own lives. And, and I think this is especially important to remember the unpredictability, the uncertainty of life, especially around this time of year, because this time of year is special to Christians. We Christians, we, we remember this weekend about the death and the resurrection of Christ. And, and in a time when we should be worshiping together, we're separated and we're spread far apart. But the central teaching that we would be celebrating together were it not for the uncertainty of life is the death and resurrection of Jesus. And maybe with all that's going on in the world, maybe, maybe we're wondering a, a practical question. What good is the resurrection today? With all that's going on, with living in this uncertain, chaotic world, in, 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 in the face of, of this crisis, what does an event 2,000 years ago say to us today? What importance can it have for us? And that's what I'd like to talk about just, just a little bit today, right from the outset of this message. I want to talk about the resurrection of Jesus, and I want to talk about how the resurrection of Christ does hold incredibly great importance for us, even today, even in the midst of a pandemic. Because in the midst of disappointments in life, in the midst of of uncertain futures, in the midst of tragedies, the resurrection of Jesus, according to the Bible, is the assurance of hope. And today, I simply want to share three reasons from God's Word that that illustrate this one important truth, that the resurrection of Christ is the assurance of our hope. And so the first thing that I want to say about about the resurrection of Christ being the assurance of our hope is that the, the resurrection assures us of hope because the resurrection assures us that God forgives us. And in forgiveness is one of the basic necessities of life. It's one of the basic needs we have. And we're especially reminded of this basic need because we're reminded right now of the fact that we're mortal, that we're not invincible. Simon Weisenthal, who was a Jewish survivor during World War II, um, he lived in an area of Europe Uh, that was conquered by Germany, and because he was a Jew, he was forced to live in a ghetto, and he was sent to work, and he faced the possibility of death. I mean, every day, these, these people lived with that, and he tells an interesting story about the need for forgiveness. Uh, During his time working in a a labor camp in his hometown, he, he had an extraordinary encounter with a, with a, a guard, an SS Nazi soldier, Um, he was summoned by a nurse to hear the dying confession of this SS officer. And the soldier, what what the soldier wanted most was the soldier wanted forgiveness. He wanted forgiveness from all of the Jewish people for the things that he had done to them. 
He asked for forgiveness as he was dying because he was afraid that his soul was not ready to meet his maker. He believed that he would not be able to rest and have peace eternally unless he was forgiven by someone. Simon relates in the story how several times he tried to leave the room because because he was afraid, because because he hated the Nazis. But he stayed and, and he listened to this soldier's story, the soldier's confession, in part because the soldier asked him, the soldier rather begged him to stay numerous occasions. And he was adamant to Simon that he needed to hear the story. He needed to hear this story in order to save himself. And more importantly, he needed Simon's forgiveness to be able to rest peacefully. And what this story that, that Simon gives us, what it illustrates is this, is this simple, basic need that we have for forgiveness. We may not have been Nazis, but we all have skeletons in our closet. And we're confronted now in a deep and an intense way with the fact that we're all mortal. And it's a real thing and it's an alarming thing. And we we have a heightened sense of this. We have a heightened sense of the memories of things that we have thought, said, or done, which we're ashamed about, which we deeply regret of which our conscience still nags at us and condemns us. And that's not to mention the things that we've left undone, the thing, the good that we haven't done, but knew to do. You know, in Jesus' ministry, he often spoke words of forgiveness, especially during his Passion Week at the Last Supper. He, he actually connected forgiveness with his death. And, and in Scripture, death is the just wages of our sin. And on the cross, the Bible says that Jesus died in our place. He died the death that we deserve so that we could be forgiven. And that's the core of the gospel message. But how is it we can be assured of this forgiveness? This forgiveness that we desperately need. This forgiveness that we know we need. How do we know for sure that God has accepted his death in our place? How can we know the assurance of forgiveness? Well, the answer lies in the resurrection of Christ. That's what the Bible teaches. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 17 through 18. He says, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. Evidently, there were some in Corinth who who doubted the resurrection. Or if they didn't doubt, maybe they didn't believe in its importance. And so what Paul does here is he sets people straight by saying that if there's no resurrection of Jesus, your faith is pointless. You're still in your sins. Everything is lost. But fortunately, he follows that up and he says the good news is that Christ was raised. It's a historical fact. The grave was empty. He appeared to the apostles. He appeared to his disciples. Over 500 people, the apostle Paul says, witnessed to the truth that they saw a resurrected Christ. And, 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 and it's something that they gave their lives for. And, and, and we know that, that no one gives their life for something they know is a lie. And, and no one will give their life for something they're not sure of. But the disciples, they were sure. They saw it with their eyes. They they give their lives for it. And the message that comes from it is this. Christ is risen, and because of it, you're forgiven. God, by raising Jesus from death, validates the sacrifice he made, and, and therefore, we have the assurance of his forgiveness because Jesus rose. You see, our assurance comes not from our good works, how we're feeling on a particular day, or whether or not we struggle. Our assurance is not found in in trying to live a spotless life. 
Our assurance is not found in, in forgetting the past. The resurrection of Christ is the assurance of our hope because the resurrection of Jesus assures us that we're forgiven. In times of crises, we can turn to Christ who gives us peace by pardoning our sin. So the resurrection assures us of God's forgiveness for our past. But as good as that is, we're still left with questions for the present. What about now? What about as you're going through this present uh, difficulty, this present disappointment, this, this disappointment over maybe a job loss because of what's going on in the economy, this disappointment over a present grief of a loved one who's passed away, the stress that you're experiencing because of the uncertainty. And that brings us to the second assurance the resurrection of Jesus gives us. And that is the resurrection of Christ is the assurance of our hope because the resurrection assures us of God's power in the present. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, Paul says that I, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. The word of God declares that we have an incomparable power at our disposal. It is, it is the power, the very power that, that God used to raise Christ from the grave. I mean, we may wonder in the midst of our uncertainty, in the midst of our depression, in the midst of our grief, in the midst of our temptation, can, can God really help me now? Can, can he bring me out of this victorious? Can he set the right, set to right the things wrong in my life? And the answer to you today from God's word is a resounding yes. And the proof of this is that he raised Jesus by his mighty power. And that that power, Paul says, can be accessed by you today in whatever situation you find yourself in. The testimony of the disciples is something they bore with their lives. They believed that that power was available in the present because Jesus rose. You see, being a Christian isn't, it's not just about saying the right words. It's, it's not about just doing the right things. Being a Christian is an act of God. Being a Christian is a, is a resurrection from sin into a, a new and liberated life. And we know that God can raise us because God raised Jesus. Walt Emerson once uh, said, What lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. I don't know what will happen to the world, I don't know what will happen to our economy. I don't know what will happen with the governments. I, I don't know if this is a judgment from God, if this is a sign of the times, or if this is just another one of those trials and tribulations that Jesus refers to that we will have to go through until the end comes. So remember what lies in you. Regardless of what this all pans out to be. Remember what lies in you. And what lies in you because of faith is the assurance of hope because Christ is our hope. What lies in you because of Christ is hope. What lies in you because of Christ is strength. What lies in you because of Christ is resiliency to face the challenges because, because you don't face them alone. You face them with God. I've, I've, in my time as a Christian and in my time as a pastor, and I don't say this lightly and I don't say this flippantly, 
But in my time as a Christian, I've seen marriages saved. I've seen lives changed. I've seen minds changed, which is the precursor to lives changed. I've seen health restored. I've seen demons exercised. I've seen prayers answered through God's power in the present. In ordinary people's lives. That's the truth we forget. If we are in Christ, we have his power in us. And he has given us the assurance of this power through his resurrection. And because of that, no disappointment, no temptation, no grief has to be too big for you. For the power he's given us is a victorious power and not even death itself can escape this power from God. So yes, we live in an uncertain world. I mean, Forrest Gump's mama, she was right. Life is like a box of chocolates. You don't know what you're going to get. I mean, one minute economic prosperity like you've never seen. And the next day, your retirement fund is cut in half. That's our world. That's our reality. But God has given us hope. And he's given us the assurance of that hope through the resurrection of Christ. He forgives our past. He gives us power in the present. And that truth is just as real today as it was 2,000 years ago. But it doesn't stop there. It gets better. Because last but certainly not least, the resurrection is the assurance of our hope because the resurrection assures us of God's ultimate triumph for our future. You see, no other worldview can offer a hope that's triumphant. In atheism, you're born, you live a while, and you die. And there's no meaning attached to your life because there is no ultimate purpose. There is no ultimate meaning. You're simply a highly developed primate who has evolved, who has no lasting value or purpose. But the message of the Christian faith is altogether different. Life is precious. That's one of the basic fundamental teachings. Life is precious. Listen, the fact that we are now, as a society, as a government, as an individual people, the fact that we are concerned for the elderly, the fact that, that we are concerned for the weak, for the sick, for those who have health issues, just shows how much our Judeo-Christian value of the sacredness of human life has shaped our country. I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm not saying we're perfect. But I'm saying there's an influence there. Because guess what? They didn't think life was all that sacred in Soviet Russia. They didn't think that life was all that sacred in Mao's China. Or even in the current climate in some countries today. We as believers say, life is precious. And because it's precious, there's meaning to it. There's purpose with it. And God has an ultimate plan for it. God is, is bringing this plan into its fruition. There, there is an ultimate end point. There's an ultimate climax that God is taking this world to. And that cannot be stopped by this crisis. Jesus said, in this life, you will have trouble, but guess what? Be of good cheer, have hope, I've overcome the world. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Peter says it this way, he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Living hope. And this hope has two aspects to it. The first aspect is, is cosmic. The second aspect is personal. In speaking about the cosmic aspect, Peter says uh, in, in his later uh, letter, 2 Peter 3, verse 13, he says, but keeping with this promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. That's the cosmic perspective. We're looking for a new universe, a new world to live in. The other is personal. 1 Corinthians 15, 42, speaking to the church, he says, so will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. 
It is raised imperishable. That's the personal aspect. At the coming of Jesus, there'll be a cosmic aspect and a personal aspect. The cosmic aspect is that we will live in a transformed, recreated universe and a recreated world where sin and death and decay are no more. The personal aspect is that, is that we get to be part of that. We get new bodies, new lives. The hope we have is, is a hope where, where there are no goodbyes. There's, there's no sin that we have to worry about. There's, there's nothing like murder or prostitution. We don't have to be concerned with financial collapse or, or global warming or, or to bring it closer to home, death or illness or, or pandemics anymore. The hope that we have is not found in a vaccine as much as we hope for a vaccine. The hope we have is not in an economic recovery as much as we hope for an economic recovery. It isn't just a wish for a longer life an extension of more of the same things that we experience here. It's something better. And instinctively, I think we know this, and instinctively, I think we crave this. A Christian college in California, they, they once sent uh, students door to door to talk with people about spiritual things. And so two, two of these students, they went to a house and they knocked on a door to find just a, a frenzied mother of three with a vacuum in one hand and a screaming baby in the other hand and food burning on the stove and a disaster in, in the living room. And the students asked the mom, they said, are you interested in eternal life? And to which the mom replied, frankly, I don't think I could stand it. You see, in the future life that God promises us, we don't want more of the same. We don't want more of the same that we experience here. What we want is something different. We want justice to prevail. We want suffering to stop. We want health. We want peace. We want wars to end. And God's word promises that all of these desires will somehow become realities. And that happens when God recreates this world and he recreates this cosmos and he recreates us and the solid, visible, tangible evidence of the fact that he will do this is that God raised Jesus Christ from death to life. And he will raise us because of that. And he will raise us new to a universe that's new because this is the hope that we're born into. That in the end, when all is said and done, God's will will triumph for his creation. And the truth of re the resurrection is the assurance of that hope. This hope is not found in political platforms, as good as some of them might be. It's not found in any self-help book or improvement course, no matter how positive we feel afterwards when we read them. This assurance is found solely in Jesus Christ and his resurrection is the assurance that we have this hope. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, we have the assurance that we're forgiven. Because of the resurrection of Jesus, we have assurance that we have power for the present. Because of the resurrection of Christ, we have the assurance of hope for the future, that God will have the last say, that he's taking history and he's taking our lives to a sure and a certain place, a place of triumph, a place of renewal, a place of recreation. In his book, Six Hours, One Friday, Max Lucado tells the story of a missionary in Brazil who discovered a tribe of, of, uh, of natives there in a remote part of the jungle. They happened to live near a large river, and the tribe was in desperate need of medical attention because there was a contagious disease that was ravaging the population. People were dying 
daily. Our hospital was, was terribly far away. It was across the river and far away. And to get to that hospital, they had to cross this river. But the problem was the, in, the, the, the natives would not cross the river because they believed that the river was inhabited by evil spirits. And to enter this water, it would mean certain death to them. Now, the missionary explained that he had crossed this river numerous times and that he was okay. He took them to the bank and he actually, he placed his hand in the water and he said, see, I'm okay. And they still wouldn't go in. He walked into the water up to his waist and he splashed water on him. And he said, see, look, I'm okay. It didn't matter. They were still afraid. They were afraid until finally he dove into the river. He swam beneath the surface until he emerged on the other side. And he raised a triumphant fist into the air that he had entered and he had escaped. And it was then that the natives broke out into, into a cheer and they followed him across the, the river. And, and that is exactly what Christ has done for us in a symbolic way in his life, in his death, in his resurrection. He came, he lived among us. He, he entered the river of death and, and, and the place of the unknown. And he came out on the other side victorious, resurrected, so that we might not live in fear, but live in the assurance of forgiveness, the assurance of God's power, and the assurance of triumph over sin and death. And that's why his resurrection is the assurance of our hope. God bless. I hope you have a happy Sabbath. Know that you are loved and know that you are missed. The Lord bless you.